1968. So I would say it was prior to that. I want to say probably like 66. I think a lot of the service salvage contract was was put up for invitation for bid. Because in essence, what the, the government did is they couldn't find any takers for the site. So they said, hey, why don't we just sell the salvage rights and in exchange also ask for X amount of equipment, what we called U.S. Air Force save items, mm-hmm. you know, like the generators, the water chillers, things like that. Why didn't they just give them back to the landowners? Well, that's a good question. That law had not yet passed Congress. I mean, of course, we saw that in later years. I'm not too sure what year that 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 happened, that the original owners that the sites were expropriated from. I do know in the Minuteman sites, quite a few of them there in the in the Whiteman sites in Missouri reverted back to their original because those laws were passed. But see, in 65, those laws hadn't been on the books yet. I mean, that so, makes sense to give it back. Say, say Joe Blue owns a thousand acre farm. The government uh-huh. takes, what, what, 10, 15, whatever Atlas is. Yeah. And you're, you're going to sell it to some third party. Oh, exactly. Right, right See, and that's one of the reasons wanted. Congress, you're, you're right, Bryce. That's why Congress wound up passing the law saying it's not fair that the original owner loses that portion of their land, doesn't get the opportunity to get it back. So that's where all of this has changed. But of course, that, you know, the other thing when I say all of this is that's why you don't see the first generation sites destroyed. Yeah. It's not like second generation. So, you know, second generation, the silos need to be destroyed. Typically, you know, the entryways need to be and there's different names for them, you know. I mean, first generation typically they were called entryways. Then Titan Two called them access portals. Yeah, you know. Well, did you, you see know, just, uh, that post that I, I put in community? It was a uh, about Reagan proposing for Peacekeeper to go in the sixty some Titan Two sites. Like if that would have happened, oh, sure. that would have been so cool. Oh yeah, you I know, mean, I still remember. I I was in school. And uh, I still remember Reagan talk about there was big talk that they were going to, you know, put put Peacekeeper on rails, but also put them in mountains in the tunnels. Yeah. And then when that when and that was de- out and, that's right. Yeah. But when that was declined, he said they're just going to go into Titan Two sites. What do you think? And then what, what, that, what do you think would have happened? Like. Obviously, you don't need a launch crew there for a peacekeeper. What would I mean? That's a, you know, that's a really good question. I think, I think at the end of the day, I don't know really how. It, take for example, if that would have, have been into the eighteen units, you know, the eighteen Titan two sites out of Tucson. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't know. You get into a dilemma here. I find that. You know, geez, are, are, is that population base too big for what we're trying to do here? You know, so I'm not sure. I mean, if we look at typically at all the other missile bases, I mean, the only one I can really think of that even comes close would be be the Beale first generation sites for Titan II. OK, the 850th. Um, because their proximity to Sacramento, California. Titan one. And so, other than that, and the only reason I'm saying this is just the just the, the pure mileage between the missile bases themselves in very, very large cities. Oh, yeah. That's um, only nine missiles, though, and they had, it said 60-something oh, sure. uh, peacekeepers. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, there's no telling. I mean, at one point, I can tell you on the Walker sites, they brought in Boeing. Boeing needed storage facilities for minute and ones. Yeah, Atlas F. They were going to store. You know, and, and they sent their engineers out here. And by the time it was all said and done, um, by the time they were to retrofit, it was going to be more the new construction. So of course the you know the feds were going to go through it a second time. Now the these. and and they just said no. It just 
come on, we're not going to spend more money than... I don't know how that would have worked anyway. You know, here, where Minuteman's being built and are manufactured, I should say, and then transported all the way down here for storage. Well, back then, too, uh, say USSR still had a target on, on the 12 sites in Roswell. Why would you store 20 Minutemans in that silo? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. I mean, I, that's... You know, I, I had an old professor at military school. He was military science for the longest time. And, uh, I mean, his position was that, and we used to have some really friendly discussions regarding, you know, the missile bases and Walker, which, of course, prior to Walker was the Roswell Army Airfield, which we were the delivery system for anything atomic for the United States military. Well, you know, what's the possibility of truly Walker being the target? And I mean, his position clear into the 70s was that Walker in Roswell, New Mexico is just as big of a target as because we're nearly 13,000 feet in runway. I mean, you know, they can have all the, we have three squadrons of B-52s. I mean, and, and I understood his point, even though the missile bases were gone. But, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I mean, why in the world would we then, you know, store them here? And, I mean, that's a really good point. I don't, you know, well, those I'm not are sure. All... We have to go back to that earlier period and say, at the time that was being discussed, I'm not sure of the year. I mean, we would then have to look at accuracy, okay? See, with first-generation sites, they're typically all eight and a half miles minimum apart, well, a lot of that was based upon our accuracy, which was roughly eight miles. I don't think it was until really kind of 1964 that we could bring that circular air probable to CEP even into a relative term of a couple miles. So, I mean, and all of a sudden things started changing too. And then, of course, you have second generation right on the back steps of of first generation, so you yeah. see the separation of where the first bases went in there at, at Maelstrom, and then of course Ellsworth. Um, yeah, you're talking you feet know. there, yards. Oh yeah, I mean it, it's it's. I mean it had to be interesting. I had a, a dear friend on a lot of the missile discussion groups, Bill Healy. Um, and Bill and I used to have an interesting conversation regarding, you know, Ellsworth, the 44th, okay? I mean, if you really think about it, they had everything. They had both, at one particular point, they had both first and second generation. They had the Ellsworth, the, the Titan Ones, okay? It both New Underwood, Hermosa, and Sturgis. And then they had the the wing of uh, they had the hundred and fifty of the Minutemans. Right. I mean that's pretty ironic. I mean, at one point during Bill's career, I think we were he would he made the comment to me it was just wild at that particular moment. You had both in that wing. You had both first and second generation. Oh yeah, that's sort of like Van uh, Vandenberg, and we've been off on that tangent, but. Just having oh, everything sure. there is, but uh, an actual Air Force base having, you know, hell, if they had Titan two two, that would be like an anomaly as far as. Well, I mean, you know, back base. then, I used to have the tough time understanding. I mean, Vandenberg had the fifty first what munitions maintenance squadron, which of course dealt with all of the the warheads, okay, and the RVs and the mating and demating of the of the warhead and rv to the missile and a friend of mine you know for years we would have the discussion that for the longest time when vandenberg was operated i mean keep in mind i mean our, the first all air force crew launch took place in september of 1959 i mean granted it was off one of the gantries 576 I, I'm not sure if it was one, two, or three. I tend to believe it was one. What are you talking, Thor? 
Yeah, an Atlas D oh, okay. was put on the alert, and the first all Air Force crew, no GBA personnel. Now, there was a lot of talk that GBA personnel were in.